Welcome to the Cross Canada Spotlight. I'm Ross Hall. Every week we take a look at a handful of the most interesting and entertaining stories produced across the Global News Network. We start this week with the story of a Kelowna woman who at 41 has been picked to return to the Olympics close to two decades after she first competed in the 2004 Games in Athens. Melindy Elmore is all smiles as she laces up a new pair of running shoes. Out on the track, the maple leaf's on the back, the same maple leaf she'll wear at the Olympic Games after being chosen to represent Canada in the marathon. It's been quite a journey. I, of course, was in Athens in 2014 and in the 1500. It's been so long since Elmore was last in the Olympics, even she sometimes gets it wrong because it was actually back in 2004, so it's easy to forgive her. Unfortunately for Elmore, she failed to qualify for the finals in Athens and eventually hung up the spikes in 2012. Had sort of moved on with life, but still loved to run. But after being named to the Central Okanagan Sports Hall of Fame in 2017, the 41-year-old mother of two decided retirement wasn't for her. I realized I still had some competitiveness left in me to, to go for. A lot of competitiveness actually, just at a different distance. Her strength now, not speed, but stamina, as Elmore set a new Canadian record in the marathon in 2020, destroying the old one by more than two minutes. It's kind of like a, a dream come true that I didn't even know I had. Now another dream is coming true, a second chance at a gold medal. After an incredible 17 year absence, Elmore has earned her shot at another Olympics. When I think about the fact that this has happened, it's kind of unbelievable. I think it just gives everyone hope, it's inspiring. Jane Ruse runs CanFund, a nonprofit that has raised over $40 million for Canadian Olympic athletes. Ruse thinks Elmore's story has the ability to captivate the country. I think there's telling women at, and anybody at any age you could do and follow your dreams. Elmore's longtime coach, agrees for someone who thought their track career or running career was over in 2012 um, it's it's been really amazing to to watch her you know come back to the level she's at now training for tokyo elmore says she's not concentrating on covid and the games she's thinking about something far more important meddling i'm prepared to just go there and you know put it all on the line and put it all on race day travis lowe global news Kelowna. Go Melindy. She's had an impressive athletic career already, but that competitive drive gave her the ability to assess her strengths and return to the Olympic Games and compete in a marathon. No small feat. Keeping with the Olympic theme now, our next story features Olympic gold medal gymnast and Calgary native Kyle Schufelt, who's just released a new book that describes the story of how he achieved Canadian gymnastics history. Take a look. It's, I think, one of the few times in my life where I actually had no other thoughts in my brain besides just what I need to do. It's been 17 years since he captured Canada's first and only gold medal in artistic gymnastics. For Kyle Schufelt, it still feels like it all happened yesterday. On that day in Athens, 2004, the nervous, sunburnt 22-year-old said three words, stepped on the floor and made history. Make it happen is what I said to myself as I stepped onto the floor. It's one of the few performances in my life, believe it or not, that I actually had that flow where it was like I was an observer watching myself do this routine. The phrase has come to define much of Schufelt's life, and it's only fitting that it's the title of his new memoir. In his first book, Schufelt takes readers beyond the gold medal, brushing past bullies in high school, a brief spell as a Hungarian movie star, and battling back from not one, but two broken legs in the lead-up to his final Olympic Games. The 39-year-old also delves into the identity crisis he faced after retiring. And it's something that I defined myself as. You know, I sat on an airplane and someone would ask me, what do you do? I do gymnastics. I'm an Olympian. And with that being said, it was really challenging after the 2008 Olympic Games to figure out my, my next purpose in life. After five difficult years, he realized the answer had been right in front of him all along. Through the book and his gymnastics center, Schufelt advocates for a culture shift within sports that emphasizes mental wellness and, above all, passion. You can reach the top of the Olympic podium in a happy, healthy, nurturing environment. 
My coach and my parents were supporters and I was the driving force. My goal is to ensure that that's the experience that every child has. A portion of sales will be donated to Special Olympics Canada and Kids Sport Calgary. Cami Kepke, Global Sports. Interesting to hear about that important support system Kyle had to help him reach his goals and make it happen. Also, how he dealt with the identity crisis many athletes face post-competition. Well, now to the story of a white horse woman just beginning her career as a TV animator and getting the opportunity to broaden on-screen Indigenous representation. We made it to the summit. The weather cleared. In the animated children's show Molly of Denali, a little Alaskan girl is the lead character. Ten-year-old Molly's adventures include her dog Suki and her family who run the Denali Trading Post. It's a show any animator would love to work on, but especially one who is Indigenous and lives in Whitehorse. Um, Molly's a very like spunky, energetic kid. She's very outgoing and I really like her character. She's pretty fun. 21-year-old Leah Fabre Dimsdale is doing an online internship on the award-winning Atomic Cartoon Show after finishing her second year in Emily Carr's Bachelor of Media Arts program. Her job includes doing storyboarding, animation, and design. It's important to me since um, I am Indigenous and I haven't really seen much representation of people that look like me um, or have grown up with experiences like me. Getting the chance to work on Molly of Denali was an unexpected opportunity for Leah after a call went out for Indigenous interns facilitated by the non-profit organization MyTax. It's a fabulous success story. It's exactly the kind of thing that we like to see. Um, she was basically brought into this uh, project, the animation project, through the internship. Uh, it's led to a great result. Uh, it's been good for Leah. It's been good for the uh, company she was working with. Leah's internship on Molly of Denali ends this summer and she'll return to Emily Carr. Hopeful she'll have more opportunities ahead to showcase Indigenous people. It's definitely one of my dream opportunities. I'm not sure exactly what I want my job to be yet, but it's definitely like working okay in an Indigenous-minded project. Catherine Urquhart, Global News. Well, such a great opportunity for Leah to get first-hand experience in a field that she's passionate about and how she was able to provide important insight into the characters on that project. Here's to many more similar opportunities as she moves ahead in whichever field she chooses. We head to Toronto now where long-term care residents in Ontario can finally resume some close contact with loved ones. Earlier this month, the province announced the easing of COVID-19 restrictions at homes across the province. Here's the heartwarming story of a mom and daughter's first hug in months. The six months that I was prevented from seeing my mother was the longest six months of my entire life. Jill Vanderkoy went more than 180 days without seeing and holding her mother until now. Hi, Charlie. Vanderkoy's 89-year-old mother, who lives with dementia, is a resident at Belmont House in Toronto. She looks deep into her eyes with tears rolling down her face, happy to embrace her first best friend. Have you been okay, honey? It's hard to put into words. I mean, it's, it's just that first hug is uh, it's precious. First hugs like this one were felt across Ontario's 626 long-term care homes as the province loosened restrictions, allowing hugging, hand-holding, and even day and overnight visits for fully vaccinated residents. It's so heart heartwarming for all of us. Hima Kerpal is a registered nurse at Belmont House in Toronto. She is also in charge of infection control. This long-term care home and retirement residents have gone this far without one positive COVID-19 case among residents even though there were positive cases among staff. I think we were able to be so successful because we implemented masks and face shields before the government mandated us to do that. Some staff even stayed on site to ensure residents remain safe during the height of the pandemic. They were the family residents needed, and Jill says that kindness will never be forgotten. Remember when we couldn't see each other and how hard that was? Do you remember that, Joni? No. Well, good. I do. There is a sense of relief that Joni may not remember the lost time as the pair stroll out of the library, ready to pick up where they left off. Morgan Campbell, Global News. 
Yeah, just one of the many difficult challenges of the pandemic and such an emotional moment to see Jill reunite with her mom. If anything, the events of the last year have taught me to cherish time spent with my family. Well, finally this week, we go back to Calgary and a story on the 10 year anniversary of the city's living donor program. We meet a woman who donated her kidney to a stranger and a recipient who received a life-saving donation. It's been 10 years since I donated my left kidney to a stranger. She affectionately calls it Lefty and wonders about who got that left kidney. Being Calgary's first living anonymous donor, she's journaled about it for the last decade, imagining if it was a mother who had the chance to watch her kids grow or a grandfather who was able to see his grandkids get married. I'm not looking for praise. I'm not looking for, you know, thank you or anything like that. I just, I, I just honestly want to know kind of how the story continued for them. More than half of all living donors aren't a blood relative, and she's okay not knowing whose life she saved. It's exponentially changed my life too in ways that I didn't think it would. I mean, I'm, I'm far more confident. I think um, it's deepened my empathy. It's made me just a, it's, it's made me a person who's willing to try things that are outside of my comfort zone. Her experience also helped shape the living donor program in Calgary and raised awareness. Waits can be up to three and a half years for transplants but it can be much shorter if more living donors sign up. Organ donation is truly an altruistic system. It's someone who wants to make a difference in this world beyond generosity, saving the life, changing the life of someone. And in anonymous cases, they will never know. This, these bring back a lot of memories. Almost 20 years ago, Carol Hockley received a kidney transplant from an anonymous donor. She has treasures throughout her life-changing journey. I think of the donor and especially the donor family a lot and I always think about how I can say thank you to them because they really gave me this ultimate selfless gift of life and so how do you really say thank you to someone? In her gratitude, she keeps her donor sacrifice always in mind, living as healthy a life as possible. Jill Croteau, Global News. Yeah, fascinating to hear a donor's experience and how a selfless act actually enriched her life, not to mention saving the life of a complete stranger. Also from the perspective of the recipient, appreciating each day thanks to a donor's gift of life and that responsibility to live life to its fullest. Well, that's it for Cross Canada Spotlight this week. Be sure to watch Global News Weekends Saturday and Sunday mornings at 7 a.m. on the Global TV app. For now, stay tuned for more news and weather.